So creating a multi-asset um, exchange, um, you're currently trading two products. What is the future looking like in terms of um, extending that? Sure. Um, I think going through the, the experience of adding a second product was actually very eye-opening. Um, mm -hmm. And I think to some extent, uh, one of the things that became uh, very clear is that in addition to getting uh, further, further economies of scale by just simply adding a, uh, a second product, what we found is that the second product actually brought more business to our first product. Um, it also has to do a lot with our business, given that we are a buy side uh, focused MTF. Uh, we found that uh, a lot of the, let's say, the participants in the second MTF were also active in the first MTF, even though in a capacity which was lesser than, um, let's say, our main participants. But overall, I would say the, it was one plus one equals two and a half as opposed to two. Okay. And I mean, the demands on a small um, MTF are challenging. S low capital base, simple technology, so therefore growing into new areas is, is quite a challenge. Um, how, do you, how do you balance this and looking at all the regulatory pressure that's coming up, what is that going to do to your future um, plans? Sure. I think this is, a, this is a very interesting question. It's something that we, um, you know, we spend uh, every day sometimes thinking about. Um, I think, as, a, as you correctly pointed out, as a small MTF, uh, you really have to be very careful about where you allocate your resources, uh, both in terms of financial resources and human capital, uh, while at the same time making sure that you are fully up to speed uh, and in line with all the uh, new regulations that come into space um, uh, you know, very frequently these days. So it, it is a challenge. At the same time, it is also part of the opportunity given that I think every day that goes by a more uh, complex regulatory environment uh, is put in place, it does create opportunities for, uh, let's say, uh, what I call quicker and more nimble MTFs to enter into certain spaces that they understand very well and you know, very quickly um, build a decent market share. So it is a challenge, while well, at the same time, um, without a question, it presents a very good opportunity. And yesterday you mentioned that you um in terms of the, the value proposition is 30 basis points per side on average. Um, in terms of your own pricing structure, do you, do you take a share of that or how do you, how do you generate revenue for the um, ETF? Our fee structure is very simple. It's a, uh, a very fixed fee, uh, as, I guess on a basis point basis per transaction. And I think this is something that um, in conversations with clients before we finalize our uh, our price structure was very important. Our clients look at themselves as the people who uh, take the risk and therefore should be rewarded for any uh, marginal benefit the MTFs take. And they, uh, they do really like to see the MTF as, a, as a, an enabler for them to actually be able to achieve better savings. So I think in, uh, when we looked at different pricing models, but it became very evident that the preference by the clients was for a, uh, a very uh, clear, transparent, and let's say fixed fee. So, okay, so you don't think the business is price elastic, or you do, or? Um, yes and no. Um, it is, I guess, the fees, I think, don't move too much because this is what the clients want. At the same time, uh, I think there's probably a, uh, what I call, significant support uh, on the fee structure. And one of the reasons is that in the fixed income space, I think the battlefront is less about, let's say, speed or technology or cost but rather about liquidity aggregation, uh, providing more transparency. And I think, as, as the client tell us, is just make it easier for us to figure out where things are. Um, what we found is clients are willing to pay for that. At the same time, it does not mean that they're happy to go out of their way and share part of the economics that they you know, rightly believe belongs to them. So that means it's, it's back to the economies of scale play, getting more and more volume. Absolutely. So, so key to getting more and more volume in, in your space is basically the, the trading screen and, um, and access to your marketplace. How, how have you developed that, and how could you develop it moving forward into a multi-asset environment? Sure. Um, I think in particular to Vega Kai, when we, um, when we built our technology, we had in mind a uh, a very flexible, uh, open, and multi-asset class system. So I think for us, uh, we had developed a multi-asset class system before we even launched our first trading platform. Um, but, but I think the, um, as I pointed out earlier, I think the, the battle here is also not about technology. I think our technology, and probably the technology that probably most, uh, let's say, competitors or potential competitors could provide, I would say is something that our customers feel is good enough. Uh, without a question, there's always room for improvement. But I feel that the, the, let's say, the marginal um, 
the additional business that could come uh, or the, uh, uh, the ability to attract more clients is actually less related to technology. Uh, it is related to uh, w marketing uh, as well as client education. And I think what you find when you enter the fixed income space is that a lot of clients, both the actual users of the products such as the traders and the portfolio managers, as well as the, uh, let's say, the infrastructure such as uh, regulatory compliance and IT, are not familiar with the MTF concept at all. So it, it is also to some extent a great, um, uh, one of the responsibilities of the MTF and the industry to actually, the, the, the various MTFs in the industry, to educate uh, all sides of the client about the benefits that they get. And I think as, uh, as Alistair pointed out earlier, uh, you know, a few years ago, maybe the concept of MTF in equities was something that was almost you know, bizarre. Now it is the, you know, everybody knows that it is a, uh, one of the main uh, ways to trade. And I will not be surprised if maybe in five years from now, or hopefully even less, uh, we will see fixed income MTS as a, um, a significant part of the, uh, let's say, of the portfolio that clients have to execute their, their businesses. Okay, maybe um, Jesper can come up while, um, and while we carry on and ask another question. So we saw from Alistair and the other MTFs how they um, focused on a single product um, and didn't do what the exchanges are doing, which is going into the multi-asset environment. Is your goal to stay in the single product space, fixed income, or other areas? Sure. I think uh, we, we like specialization. Um, well, at the same time, I think being in fixed income is probably a bit less monolithic than, let's say, being in equities. And the reason is we have, uh, you know, mo most of our fixed income clients tend to trade across different segments on the fixed income markets, which, you know, even though they all fall within fixed income, realistically, they're almost distinct asset classes. You know, for example, uh, I think one can say that, you know, government bonds, high-grade corporate bonds, convertible bonds, uh, and high-yield bonds uh, are all distinct asset classes, even though they still, you know, fall within the, the fixed income category. So to answer your question, uh, you know, our plan and our strategy is to stick to the, uh, let's say, the broader uh, universal products we understand, which is fixed income. Uh, realizing at the same time that, uh, you know, to go also back to uh, Seth's um, uh, example yesterday, there's a big plane with many different compartments, and you want to make sure that you put the, the people that want to drink the same kind of wine and want to have the same kind of steak together uh, from the rest of the people. So you like the curtain? Yes, I like okay. the curtains. Yeah. Okay, so Jesper, welcome. This is uh, Jesper von Zweiberg, head of derivatives from Oslo Bors. Oslo Boss is quite a diversified market, lots of different asset classes and products. Um, how do you see diversification moving forward at Oslo Boss, and what does actually diversification mean to Oslo Boss, given you've got so much already? Yeah, um, we might have a uh, slightly different take on what uh, diversification is and, and uh, how to become global. Uh, I represent a, a, an exchange that is just six years short of 200 years old. So uh, we are definitely one of those exchanges that uh, has taken a beating in the discussions here today and are supposedly uh, gonna disappear in the next couple of years. Um, diversification for us is uh, looking at uh, the needs of our client base. Uh, why do we still exist, uh, Oslo Bors? Um, we have a, a very strong uh, corporate finance culture in, in, uh, in Norway and uh, we are the primary listing exchange for uh, those areas that uh, are, are the most important areas for, for Norwegian brokers and Norwegian banks and uh, how, how we can play together with uh, our, uh, uh, our banks out there and create products within those spaces uh, is is the way forward for us and and corporate finance in in Norway yeah that, that's a strong industry uh, but only in certain sectors and that is the key to Norway uh, there are a few certain sectors uh, that are very strong uh, oil offshore industries and and uh, fish food and and to some extent uh, shipping and uh, th those areas are definitely the ones for the exchange to be focusing on when uh, evaluating uh, starting new products. Uh, we don't really have um, any reasons to, to go into any types of products. We, we will have to narrow down and uh, focus on, on uh, specific areas if, if we are to achieve something. 
So if you're focused on those three areas, what does that mean for you in terms of global diversification? I saw you've done a joint listing arrangement with the Singapore Exchange. What other um, global diversification opportunities exist for you? And in the primary marketplace, in, in uh, the listing business, uh, we have partnerships both with uh, Singapore and a uh, similar one with uh, Toronto. Uh, reason being that uh, both Canada and, and uh, Singapore, Singapore has uh, similarities with uh, Norway in, in uh, their strong sectors. Uh, so we have uh, partnerships in, in uh, laying a, a easy foundation for uh, cross listings and uh, secondary listings uh, between uh, our uh, uh, companies. Uh, that is uh, educating uh, about uh, each other's regulations and uh, making it easier to, to uh, move into the various markets. And on uh, the Druti space, um, the wave has been for us in, in order to uh, uh, attract uh, global participants is uh, to set up a good distribution model. Uh, again, a, a local and fairly small exchange, we haven't really got the resources as uh, some, some others in, in uh, being everywhere in the world, having sales forces everywhere and uh, connecting all, all the banks out there. Uh, so we have work partnerships uh, in the derivative space as well. Uh, we're partners uh, now with Turquois, and uh, members of Turquois uh, has full access to trading Norwegian products in uh, a common order book. That used to be a partnership with EDX and, and Nasdaq OMX. So uh, over the past 20 years, we've uh, been using partnerships in the international distribution model for derivatives, which has been uh, very good for us. Okay. Uh, in addition, um, early, about 10 years ago, you were just the exchange on your own, no CCP, and the CSD was a separate company. Now it's all merged. You have a CCP, if, 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 as far as I'm aware. And it, now you're essentially a vertical silo. What was the drive behind that, and what, why did you need to diversify into this vertical structure? Well, we saw that, uh, that change was coming. And uh, in order to understand the, the need of change and uh, to, to organize um, the actions to, to handle it, uh, three small uh, local players, a small uh, clearinghouse, a, a, a small C CSD and a small exchange, uh, well, made much better sense in, in merging these three small into something slightly bigger. Uh, and then we could uh, approach uh, these changes together. And uh, I think that uh, the fact that we now do have uh, uh, a local like, cash equity CCP is a result of that. And, and we don't only have it, it's actually working quite all right, that CCP. And without uh, those, um, without the merger and, and doing that approach together, uh, I don't think yeah, that it had happened, uh, and um, I th think at, at least our local members are quite pleased that we have taken these steps in order to uh, keep these services locally in Norway. And on the on the technology side, unlike Vega Chai, who built their own technology, you've gone, you've switched partners. You were previously with Nasdaq OMX. You're now with um, Millennium, um, and so theoretically, that would mean that any member of the LSE group, subject to getting membership with you, can automatically access you because it's hosted out of London. How does that help you diversify and gain uh, volume and improved EBIT? We're uh, we're not yet on Millennium. We'll uh, 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 we'll we're yeah. still on Trade Elect. Yeah. Uh, we're uh, going out for Millennium in, uh, later this year, okay. and. Uh, well, just speaking to our uh, international client base now about this project in, in uh, leaving a, a trade elect for uh, Millennium uh, gives us a very good answer and indication of, of the importance of it. Uh, th there's a, a lineup of, of, um, of traders that uh, are just waiting for it. They're, they're not trading it today. 
uh, they're just waiting for the new technology. So we, we, uh, we do really expect uh, to have an uptake later on this year. And, and, and using partners in, in uh, the technology space, uh, for us, it, it's a no-brainer. We, we, ca we simply can't uh, create our own, uh, our own technology, especially since we're uh, both in, in uh, cash, we're in, in derivatives, and we're in the clearing space, and we're CSD. Uh, it, it's simply out of the question. Uh, and, and having one partner with uh, strong technologies in, uh, well, at least on, uh, on the exchange side in, in uh, all, all the areas uh, is very important for us. And that was uh, the, the most important thing for us when we three years ago uh, made a decision to, to partner up with uh, LSC uh, rather than uh, with uh, NASDAQ OMX that we had done in the past. Okay. I'd like to invite Christian Katz up, CEO of Swiss Exchange. But while Christian's coming up, um, you're, you're outside the EU. What, what disadvantage or advantage does that make? And well, the disadvantage is that uh, we have uh, regulators that are very much likely to follow uh, the incentives down in the EU, but uh, you can't be 100% sure. Uh, that's definitely a disadvantage. The advantage is that uh, everyone in the EU uh, has uh, very, well, we have very little understanding of uh, how our regulator is behaving. Uh, the rest of <laughs> Europe has an even smaller understanding of how our regulator is uh, behaving. Uh, so even though we are part of uh, Europe and we are more or less going to have exactly the same rules as the rest of Europe, uh, that, that could be some uh, local flavors to it. And uh, most likely lo those, uh, those local uh, flavors are, are going to be heavier regulation in some certain areas. And uh, being, being there locally uh, with the local contact with uh, the regulators, uh, of course, is, is, uh, it's, a, it's an absolute must uh, in order to understand when and how you should uh, develop uh, your, your various services. Christian, welcome. Um, you have a similar structure, but even wider and broader than um, Oslo Bors, fully vertically integrated marketplace with the um, other aspects as well, the payments and cards, businesses, etc. How do you leverage that whole infrastructure to grow a, a multi-asset um, marketplace? Um, I, th I think when I when I listen to also the other speakers on the panel here, they, um, it looks to me as a lot of the innovations to diversify away from one product or a particular offering is behind us, in our sense, right? So the um, we started off, uh, and I adore what uh, Constantinos has done with his MTF, but we started off the uh, the predecessor company, the early exchanges in Switzerland were created between 1850 and 1866, and they started off trading Napoleonic, post-Napoleonic war bonds, <laughs> because those weren't exactly paying back 100%. So, you know, people got together to trade these, and, you know, from that onwards, um, today we are multi-asset exchange, we have a big post-trading business, which is very international, is interoperable, as you know, um, on several markets, and uh, we've got a payment business, and we have a data vending business. So a lot of the things that were said earlier this morning, that you have to get into indices, you have to come up with creative new indices. You know, we are in stocks, we're running uh, well over 10,000 indices, many of them just created in the last 12 months. So I think a lot of this is behind us, and I guess with age, as you survive, you get usually away from a single product offering. And I would think that many of the young companies here, you know, in 20 years, uh, as and when they're around, they will have diversified the revenue stream. But I, at the same time that I'd say like, you know, we're probably very mature having merged all this, you know, um, similar to the Norwegian example, um, maybe slightly bigger scale, but we merged all this in 2008 and to now as you say, a vertical silo, but an open silo, 
So mm -hmm. we have competition on e-trading, we have competition in clearing, um, in payment systems. So the challenge, though, I think remains the same, right? So even though we are here, maybe on the time scale, we're slightly, you know, a few steps maybe further than other companies, but the challenge remains, right? We have to find um, new products. We have to listen to our customers. And I think that's the process that we are following over time. First, we listen to customers. Then we usually integrate our IT with their IT. So, you know, those are not two disjointed things. So we try to integrate the solutions, then we internationalize as our big members and clients internationalize, and at some stage, you know, we internationalize ourselves. So we kind of decouple and with new clients and into new regions, we kind of use that momentum to continue expanding. What do you see as the future um, areas of diversification? Last year you developed the LiquidNet service. What's on the cards? There are several things that we have in focus. One is, um, you know, we, we like to think of the business as a listing business, a trading business, data business, and then, you know, refined data business, the index business. And I think on all stages we are um, internationalizing on the, uh, on the listing side. It's mainly, so far, it's on the bond listings, which are internationalizing a lot more. And, you know, the special thing we have is a structured products market. It's also, also like a bond market, but with a funny payoff and um, has a separate regulatory environment. But we've been internationalizing the listing of structured products very much, and we'll continue to do that. We get like special solutions, like securitized, collateralized solutions, which are internationalizing. And um, on the trading side, I think we will add more products onto the exchange. And so again, um, things that were not traded before an exchange, such as uh, you know, uh, OTC created structure products, we will we plan to take on. And uh, on the index side, in the data and index, I think it's very clear we're building a new index calculation platform uh, for stocks, our joint venture. And um, once this is live, I think we will continue to produce new indices, you know, on customer demand, tailor made or mainline uh, leading indices. A common theme that applies to each of you is um, big competition from the OTC space. Um, how are you each addressing, Constantinos, maybe you can address that to start with? Sure. Um, you know, I think as you correctly pointed out, um, it, it is one of the main issues that um, ourselves and probably many other MTS are currently facing. And uh, the, the one thing we look at and say, there has to be a better way to do this is the fact that uh, there are very direct savings that uh, incur to clients every time they trade in, let's say, a more transparent and liquid environment, plus the uh, almost like intangible benefits of transparency and being able to justify you know, their own decisions, let's say investment decisions in a better way. Um, I think uh, distribution and client education, to come back to them, are two very key points. Uh, I think the um, in some new markets, uh, some new, I guess, electronic venues, which are now trading what used to be just OTC until recently, um, we have to get out there and make sure that the clients are fully educated about the benefits uh, that they take on board when they uh, join uh, such platforms. But traditionally, in, in the space you're operating in, transparency has been the antithesis of market information leakage. How do they make that? mental leap to say, right, I'm going to be transparent. I think the, um, our clients are very concerned about indiscretion rather than transparency. I think uh, it's fair to say that uh, all our clients want to see a, um, a marketplace which is currently more uh, liquid and transparent. Mm -hmm. And I think they can also understand at the same time that uh, you know, some changes will impact them slightly negatively, but on an overall basis, the benefits they will incur will be much greater. The one thing they also get in addition by trading in an MTF that provides anonymity is the, you know, the lack of uh, uh, what I call sales force indiscretion that is a very common theme uh, in, the, in the OTC market. Uh, and there was a recent survey, I think, by the, the trade uh, magazine. Um, and I, I, if I remember correctly, they, 
They pointed to Salesforce indiscretion in the OTC space as probably one of the biggest issues that they currently face. And this is uh, with buy side institutions being the respondents to the survey. So uh, I think there's a, a very good way to reconcile transparency uh, with uh, fixed income markets. Jesper, in, in uh, Norway, how are you battling with the OTC space? Um, we're, um, the OTC space in, in equities derivatives in Norway has been uh, quite stable. Uh, they're doing uh, some two-thirds of uh, the total market, and uh, that hasn't changed over the last five years or so. So um, Lehman, etc., hasn't made, uh, ha had any effect on, on uh, the volumes uh, being traded OTC. And back, I, I think we probably made us uh, and uh, other exchanges, exchanges pro probably made mistake uh, five, ten years ago in uh, not being pro proactive enough in order to, to uh, stop the outflow to the OTC space. Uh, we saw that in Norway um, some ten years ago and once that had had been done, uh, the, the market participants, they had created their own new structures on, on how to do things and uh, to change it back wasn't, uh, well, uh, you sure. needed some uh, very good incentives in order to move it back. Now today, uh, from out of those two thirds, uh, some of those volumes uh, could very much uh, quite easily be put back into standardized uh, trades. And uh, let's see if MIF MIFID will accomplish that. Uh, uh, but the, 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 the main part of it are, are trades that uh, sh must be flexible. And, and uh, for that purpose, we have uh, started our own an MTF uh, two years ago, Oslo Connect it's called, uh, that, that is, um, uh, and it has a, a trading system, a flexible uh, order match negotiation uh, trading system, B clear, C screen, kind of uh, all in one, uh, but straight through processing. And uh, we believe that uh, such a flexible system is uh, what the market uh, uh, requires in, in order to uh, move their flexible, uh, their tailor-made contracts uh, into uh, the cleared space. And uh, we haven't seen the effects of it uh, yet. We're, we're still uh, talking uh, with our... Um, main members and, and uh, tweaking uh, the systems a bit in order for the systems to, to be fully in line with the internal processes of uh, our members and, and uh, hopefully we'll have that in place when uh, the Emir uh, kicks in and um, then the system should be uh, there and available and uh, hopefully our members are, are happy with the incentives models uh, that we're uh, offering them. We're, uh, we are going away from treating uh, standardized uh, derivatives and, and uh, cleared only derivatives separately and uh, we have uh, them uh, uh, in one um, fee model with, uh, with the fee incentives um, targeting both, both types of trades. Right. Christian, how are you tackling the OTC space? Um, I think I think your your example um, that we showed, like you know, salesperson information leakage, just shows you that OTC that the players in an OTC space look over and look to the exchanges and think like it's adorable what these exchanges have, right? This transparency, straight through processing, netting, all this stuff, it's unbelievable. And at the same time, the exchange crowd, um, you know, looks over to the OTC markets like, ah, oh, you know, they have like, they can murk around, they can do whatever, they don't have these reporting obligations. And, you know, it's like not even clear how big it is because we don't know how big it is, only the players inside know. So I think both sides seem to um, have their um, drawbacks. So one way to attack the fact that the OTC space has a lot of valuable pluses that the exchange space can never fill. A lot of innovation power you just can't do on a standardized venue usually. It happens in an OTC space. But I think the, so, so what you should do is try to push the advantages of OTE, like over the exchange versus 
the OTC advantages, and I think there are several. And you know, a lot of this had to do with um, education. You have to educate investors, you know, where they have to look for their execution, how actually things are done, where they can check. Uh, it's a bit harder with fragmentation, but you know, it is possible. Mm -hmm. I think the other thing that needs to be done is a little bit of kind lobbying activity because you know OTC is supposed to be um, at least in the EU um, it's supposed to be bilateral unsystematic trading now you know it's kind of questionable when certain you know say types of execution venues which are called OTC are doing like four billion turnover in whatever asset and you know about 50,000 trades so you got to think like is that really bilateral unsystematic so I think we have to make sure that you know, it, what, what is multilateral gets captured in a multilateral definition. And I think the other thing is, um, you know, you, we have to produce products which are very favorable to a transparent lit market, such as passive investment products, right? You mm -hmm. know, this morning was about, you know, and Alistair mentioned it, the index business and passive investments. Like our exchange thrives on passive investment solutions, ETFs. We have now a 15% market share in Europe on ETFs, been growing every year. Um, and you know other structured solutions, and a lot of those are index-based, a lot of those trade very heavily on an auction day. Mm -hmm. And you know, you know, people want that, people want the transparency, mm -hmm. people want the print on the auction day, on the triple wedge. It's important to them you know, in order to manage their portfolios properly. So I think that's, that's what we do, like we create products that favor our space, but we need to educate and we need to also kindly, you know, influence and educate the politicians which make the rules. Bit of a difficult challenge. Are there any questions from the audience, please? You've got a distinguished panel, um, very different uh, MTF and two out of the EU exchanges, but behave like EU exchanges. <laughs> Questions? No? Okay, well then, we've managed to catch up uh, the time. So what I'd like to do is, first of all, thank our distinguished panel. Thank you very much.